have you ever thought to yourself that things just can't get any stranger? But then they do. Clearly, my first post opened the floodgates, and I've been inundated with memories of occurrences that should never have been forgotten. As it would be impossible to put these things into some sort of order, I won't even bother to try. So I'll just post when I remember something. This one revolves around the little lass I saw standing in the doorway of my hospital room. I can't recall the time, day, or date of this, as not only was it so long ago in 1991, but I was still drugged up to the eyeballs on who knows what. I had recovered enough for the next step in surgery, and that was the skin grafting. My surgeons were very clever and forward-thinking folk. They had put my lost leg into a freezer in order to harvest the skin for the graft. The area where skin is taken from usually hurts far more than the graft itself, and so for them to think of this so far in advance earns my utmost gratitude, as that would give me one less headache in the future. The first hospital I attended sent me to a hospital called Shotley Bridge, where I was placed at the hands of Dr. Barry, who took good care of me. I was put to sleep every two to three days, simply because they couldn't move me without it. So sleep for bath, sleep for x-rays, sleep for hairbrush, sleep for this and sleep for that. The burn care unit wasn't known for their excellent child care abilities, however, and they failed to detect a kidney infection. A kidney infection isn't like a normal urinary tract infection, much like a migraine is not a normal headache, and a kidney infection can take hold in a matter of hours. My back started to hurt, and they brushed it off, put it down to my injuries, so they increased my painkillers. My back got worse, and they still brushed it off. Worse still, and they finally did a few tests, nothing showed up, so they again increase the pain medication. Two weeks later, and the only way to describe the level of pain I felt is to tell you what I did about it. Some sweet soul in the unit had given my mother one of those gel packs to help with my back and instructed my mom to warm it up in the microwave, wrap it up in a towel, and put it where it was needed. This is fine for a bog standard backache, but for kidneys with an infection untreated for two weeks? Warm just wasn't good enough. So I had my mother heat this gel pack up in the microwave, and when she wasn't looking, I would slip the towel off and put that scalding hot gel directly onto my bare skin. She had to heat that thing up every couple of hours because I kept complaining that it had gone cold. Scalding hot gel placed onto the naked skin every two hours isn't a good thing to do, I might add, and certainly not for two weeks. When Dr. Barry came by to discuss the grafting with my mother, she casually mentioned my aching back. And so, he said he would examine me immediately for anything out of the ordinary. Apparently, a back that resembles corned beef is out of the ordinary, and so is bloody piss. He only needed to take one look at the catheter bag to know what I had. Have you ever seen a furious surgeon? I have and it's nothing short of downright scary. I watched through the window opposite my bed as Dr. Barry spoke as quietly and calmly as one could speak, his smiling face nodding with each word said. The two nurses who stood in front of him were ghost white as he asked, why, exactly, a patient hadn't been tested for infection? A patient who, and this is where he raised his voice, not only had a gaping wound where her hip was supposed to be, but a patient due for an extensive skin grafting operation. His voice lowered, but I heard how he casually explained that this infection could have, more or less, killed me on the operating table. His ease and friendliness belied how angry he was. And I knew I never wanted to be on Dr. Barry's bad side, ever. I told the above simply to make you fully aware of how atrocious the child care in that unit was. And now, you'll be able to completely understand this story. My home city had a fundraiser for me, and enough money was earned from my mom to buy me a few bits and bobs to help keep the boredom at bay. 
One of those bits and bobs was a small TV and video player that I used to watch my beloved horror movies. Yes, I had been watching horror since I was three and old enough to navigate the stairs, go down the hallway, and watch the evil dead through the 30 degree crack under the living room door handle. So this particular night in the BCU, I was watching Jaws when I saw something out of the corner of my eye, or more like someone, to be precise. She belonged in the room to the left of mine, but there she was, standing in my doorway, with blood literally squirting out of her left arm. She was around five, seven at most, and she just stood there looking in at me while her blood spattered across my room door. Because of the pain meds had been increased so much due to the infection, neither my brain nor my mouth could function properly. And so for about a full minute complete, I simply stared at her, and she smiled and waved. What did I do? Smiled and waved back, of course. I was 11, off my face, and had been told so many times that I was just hallucinating that I honestly thought that girl was as real as all the other people I saw. It wasn't until I spoke that my mother woke up to see how I was speaking to, yelled, and basically raised the roof. 8 p.m. at night, and she phoned Dr. Barry even as she tried to find nurses. Keyword there, folks, is tried. My mother ended up taking some of the gauze from my stash of dressings and seeing to the little lass herself until some staff could be heard hurrying down the hallway, their blame game louder than their footsteps. The girl had pulled her IV right out of her vein, and without anything to prevent it, her blood was spouting everywhere and the area where she had stood pretty much looked like Tina's bedroom from Nightmare on Elm Street. Her parents went off at the staff, which they can't be blamed for. The staff on that unit were as much good as a chocolate fire guard. I know two of those nurses were fired, while one received a formal warning. Unfortunately, one of the new staff turned out to be a total asshole, and she didn't last long either. As for those other people I hallucinated, that's for another post. And so, until then, I'll say thank you to anyone who reads this. Cinders. So, after my skin grafting was done, I remained on the burn care unit for a while longer before being moved up to the children's ward, which wasn't much better, if I'm honest. Though, it's where the weirdness first began. Layout of the children's ward was like many other hospitals. Beds laid out in two opposing rows with about eight beds in each row, and the private rooms were further up near the nurse's station. It didn't get very dark at all on a night down my neck of the ward, as the moon was generally right outside the windows behind my bed. And so, for me, the ward was always nicely lit on a night. I could watch the nurses as they did their checks and whatnot, could spy on the girl opposite me as she sneaked her chocolate at the same time as me. And honestly, nighttime on the children's ward was always my favorite time. I was in the second bed from the bottom of the ward, and in the bed to my right was a boy whom I'll call Mushy. He had been badly burned on his torso after being left alone by his parents, after he had finished playing with his motorbike. Yes, a motorbike for an 11 year old. Mushy had gone into his house to set up the fire. It was a disaster waiting to happen for the poor lad. Anyway, my mother stayed with me throughout my time in the hospital, often sleeping in a makeshift bed on the floor, using nothing but sheets and pillows. Mushy's parents weren't exactly up for an award, and we rarely saw them visit him. So when Mushy had a nightmare, my mother took up the duty of seeing to him. She would get up off that cold floor, tired and aching, and go take care of a boy who was more or less left to fend for himself. I heard him one night as his nightmare started, and could hear the mattress responding to his tossing and turning, could hear his cries for his mom when I saw my mother lean over him as she usually did. I smiled at her and watched as she pressed a finger to her lips before I could say anything, so I simply resumed my hobby of counting ceiling cracks. Nothing whatsoever about that moment struck me as odd. Not until I slowly went to take some chocolate out of my small bedside table drawer and saw my mother. 
still asleep in her uncomfortable bed on the floor. She was out cold for a change, and when I looked back towards Mushy's bed, she was still there, leaning over him. Only this time, she was more like a shadow than a person. And I thought it was probably just me finally cracking up due to trauma or something. But I kept looking. It was slightly taller than the average person. Slimmer. And the facial features were silhouettes of sort. I couldn't make out any clothing or shoes or anything like that. The person, or whatever, was just leaning over Mushy, as though they had never seen a child before, much less a male child. Because the only word to describe what little expression it had was fascination. The shadow person, as I called it, looked back at me and again pressed a finger to the lips. And silent I remained as I just kept on watching what they did. At one point, I'm sure the shadow stroked Mushy's head and face, then pulled at the blankets around him. And it was shortly after that that the shadow just went. Didn't disappear or melt into the ground. It was there one minute and gone the next, leaving behind absolutely no trace whatsoever. I wasn't afraid of the shadow person, but then I had just a quarter of my body torn off, so I figured nothing could be scary after that. So there I was, an 11-year-old slyly eating a bar of dairy milk at 2 a.m. in a hospital bed and just watching the shadows stare down at a boy in the bed next to me. I didn't call for a nurse, didn't wake up my mother, or pretty much do anything other than eat and watch. I mean, there's no harm in looking, is there? And that's what the shadow was doing until it wasn't there anymore. I simply shrugged it off and put it down to me losing what few marbles I had left. After all, who would believe a girl in a hospital that was drugged up to the eyeballs about something like that? Not a word about that incident left my mouth until two months down the line, when a nurse from that ward drove all the way from that hospital to come visit me. She took me down to the cafeteria for a Coke and sandwich, then outside for a short walk, which is when I told her about the shadow person. Apparently, the nurses on that ward thought it had been my mother going around and checking on the kids at night, but when the oddities continued after I was sent back to Durham, the whispers began. They never knew who was tucking kids in at night, who was stopping Mushy's nightmares, and pulling the curtains around the beds. But since no harm was ever done, they just ignored it. She didn't say much else on the subject, and she didn't seem to be all that uncomfortable with it, so I simply let it go, and we carried on discussing my recovery and the physiotherapy hell that was about to come my way. Cinders. Hey everybody, I'm Bella Deadwood, and thank you for watching my video. If you have a story you would like narrated, you can send me a private message with the story and a note giving me permission to tell it, or you can head over to Reddit's Our Free Horror Stories and post it there. Thank you to our Alessa for sharing her story with us, and if you would like to read it for yourself, there will be a link in the description box. Thank you again, and until next week, I'll leave you with your nightmares. Good night, guys.